Prashna Bhandari and I work at the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics. So CDFD is a, an organization that is funded by the Department of Biotechnology and uh, primarily one of our, the main responsibilities in our organization is uh, DNA fingerprinting and molecular diagnostic services. We also have research in DNA fingerprinting and diagnostics and in addition to that we have about uh, 18 laboratories that are engaged in basic research and studying many different disciplines of life science. So my own laboratory is called the laboratory of cell signaling and our focus is on a small molecule called IP7 and I'll tell you more about it uh, in, a, in just a bit. So the focus of our lab, which is now 10 years old, uh, is, is a small molecule. It's basically a six-membered ring. It's like a hexagon. And on each corner of the hexagon, we have a carbon atom. Okay. Uh, immediately, a high school student would think of benzene because they know about benzene in the six carbon rings and the electrons, you know, resonating. But an even simpler molecule is if all the six carbon atoms, uh, you know, have hydrogens on them and we have, uh, it's, it's cyclohexane, okay. And on the cyclohexane, the hy one hydrogen on each carbon can be replaced by a hydroxyl or an OH group, okay. So the, chem the proper chemical name is cyclohexane hexol. So any high school student would be able to draw the structure of that. Uh, but the name for the biological molecule is inositol. So you think you hear about glucose and you know uh, ribose and these are sugars. Inositol is also a sugar but it's a very simple structure. It has no aldehyde or keto group and it's just cyclohexane hexol. So six carbons decorated with six hydroxyls. Now what biology has been able to do, what living organisms have been able to do is take the simple scaffold and start replacing these hyd hydroxyl groups, substituting them by adding a phosphate. So if you have six carbons, six hydroxyls, you can add up to six phosphates around the ring. So biological molecules may have, you know, one, two, three, four, five or all six hydroxyls substituted with phosphates and all sorts of combinations. So you can immediately see how many molecules can be generated by combinatorial substitution of hydroxyls with phosphates. So what is a phosphate? It's a phosphorus atom with oxygens around so phosphate. Now about uh, 25 odd years ago, so the, the study of these inositol phosphates is, is it's an old discipline of biochemistry and a lot of work was done you know starting in the mostly in the 60s, 70s but in the early 90s people found that uh, in, in, in an amoeba actually, one group in amoebae and one group found this in uh, mammalian cells that cells have the ability to add more phosphates onto, an, onto the existing phosphate. So theoretically now you can think of the number of possible combinations, like you can go on adding phosphates. But what we have identified so far in living organisms are up to 8 phosphates, which means that two phosphates at, on one carbon, you know, five phosphates on the others, that's seven. Then another one where you got two phosphates on this end, two on this end and four on the other carbons, that's eight. So the class of molecules that I work with are these IP7 and IP8 and they are distinguished by the property of that diphosphate. That having that second phosphate attached to a, a phosphate which is in turn attached to the carbon, that second phosphate has a lot of properties. One property that we identified, uh, I did that a little over 10 years ago when I was a postdoctoral researcher in the US and what we found is that that second phosphate, because it's surrounded by all this charge, can come off easily and release a lot of energy and then it can go onto a protein. So we call this phenomenon protein pyrophosphorylation. So what is pyrophosphorylation? The pyro means fire, fire is energy and pyrophosphate is two phosphates because when you break that bond between the two phosphates you release a lot of energy. 
So, and why do we call it protein pyrophosphorylation? Because this molecule, which is called an inositol pyrophosphate, because it had two phosphates on the inositol ring, transfers the second phosphate onto a protein, and that protein already has a phosphate on it. So, a protein with a phosphate on it takes the second phosphate from the inositol, grabs onto that, and makes two phosphates on the protein. So, this molecular level modification that I have just described to you is a modification that we identified. So, when I started my own lab, uh, one of the main goals of the lab was to see, okay, we identified this modification in a test tube. How is it relevant? You know, biologically, what does it do? So, in the past 10 years, we have found that uh, it can regulate the rate of protein synthesis in the cell. It's a very basic process, you know. It can regulate the rate at which uh, little vesicles, little uh, round packets move inside the cell because those packets, those vesicles are like your cars, you know. They transport things from one point to the other and they move along these highways, these microtubules. And the, the way that these cars are sort of attached onto the highway is through these, uh, you know, kind of a, a glue, but it's, it's, it's smooth, you know. So the, 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 there's friction, but it also moves along. So there are these motors that move along the highways. And we found that, you know, modification of one amino acid on one motor, you know, at one site, regulates the way that the attachment of the packet, the vesicle, happens onto the highway. So we go from, you know, phenomenon to really molecular level detail in trying to understand how this one modification we identified in a test tube is relevant in biology, right? Another recent work that we did that we don't know how it's linked to this modification, but we started off with making a mouse that has low levels of IP7, and then because of that, uh, the male mice are infertile. And it was a male-specific phenotype, not find, found in female mice. So then, you know, another student spent another six years of work and found out that the spermatid, you know, when it matures, it goes from round to comma shape. And he found that when the mice don't have the protein that makes this molecule IP7 that I told you about, the, the, the round spermatid stay this way and then they don't take the comma shape, okay? And so he figured out that there is RNA in the spermatid that needs to be stored, right? Because when, when a nucleus is round, you know, the DNA can be transcribed to make RNA, which then is translated to make protein. But if you start compacting the DNA, you can't transcribe it. So when the cell is round, it makes RNA, then it stores it. So then when the DNA starts getting tight, it uses that RNA to make protein. So then he found that because I don't have the granule to store the RNA, the RNA is translated early and as a result of that, the cells that are supposed to become like this, they stay like this. So we see, you know, many different things like this, all centered around this one molecule of interest and what all it does. So at a personal level, I think it's, it's two things, okay? At a very personal level, it's the joy of discovery, right? It is really rewarding to ask the question, figure out how to answer it and then answer it at least to some extent. But while you're answering one question, you come up with another and you know, and the cycle repeats. I think the second thing I really enjoy is, is seeing how young scientists who come, you know, out of, let's say, a, with a master's degree or a bachelor's degree, and then how they, they mature over time, you know, with the right kind of interest mentorship to become from trainees to independent researchers themselves. So that process of being able to uh, make more scientists is very rewarding, you know, help more people come into a life of science like I did. So I think those, those are the two things. 
in the larger picture, there is the contribution of science to society, which is not immediately visible, either, you know, to me or to a member of the public who asks me, like, so why do I care, you know, if you are excited about this molecule IP7 and that second or that seventh phosphate on it and goes and binds a protein, why do I care, right? But I think uh, there it, it is a, it's a very sort of, having knowledge and it's, it's a diffuse knowledge base is relevant, right? I can tell you, yeah, why do you care, you know, because male fertility is dependent on this process or I found that blood clotting is dependent on the presence of this molecule or insulin secretion is dependent on the presence of this molecule and if I provide all that information or people like me do that, then somewhere somebody else will find it relevant. But I can't immediately tell you where and how it will be relevant. <laughs> right.